Okay, so I am going to start with some announcements. So, this is the last class today obviously, uh, as I had already mentioned as a final exam on Friday. Okay, it is going to, I put out a sample final, just because lots of you asked, I never you put out the sample final usually, but I did anyway. There are no solutions, okay, so somebody asked, asked about them. Uh, so, I do not have any to offer you because we did not prepare one last year. Okay, but if you have any questions, ask us. Uh, it is only a day before the final is going to go out. Uh, the other announcement was about regrade requests. I think we found a lot of issues with grade scope. It is the first time we are actually using grade scope in this class, and uh, I think because of some misunderstanding of how it works, we saw a bunch of issues. The first is several quiz questions got graded incorrectly, even though the, the auto grader is configured the way we think it should be configured, but it marked the an correct answers as incorrect, so we are fixing all that. The second issue which we found is, uh, and nobody said anything until recently, is no solutions were ever released. Okay, so it, it, the grade scope was supposed to actually make the solutions visible as soon as the due date passes, but there were no solutions of any sort, not even for homeworks and exams, which nobody asked. But nevertheless, I have told the TAs to put all the solutions of everything we did uh, on grade scope and what not. So, because some of the regrade questions were simply not being clear what was expected. If you had seen the sample solution, you would not even raise that regrade request. So, after seeing all of this, I made sure that everything will get taken care of today. It is late, but we will still do it. Okay, you will still have all the solutions and what not. Okay, so, so all your regret requests are actually either processed or being processed and we will make them visible by end of the day hopefully. Okay? Okay, so, that should take care of that. Lab 3 is still under uh, being graded. Hopefully, soon we will have it, but at this point you should focus on the final exam okay? and uh, we will have all the grades done next week. Okay? All right. So, let us uh, start. So, today is our last lecture. We are going to do a very quick uh, run through security. This is usually a two lecture sequence, I have compressed it into one. So, some topics have become much shorter than what I would like to, but we have only one class remaining. So, that is what we will do today. Okay. So, let me start with what we are going to do. So, what I will do is may maybe some of you have already taken a course in security. There are other classes that cover some of this in a lot more detail. Uh, so, if you have some of the early material is going to be repetitive, but for those of you who do not have a background, I am going to start with some very basic issues in security and then we will get to distributed systems and how we can use these ideas in distributed system. Okay, so, let us start with the authentication. Okay. So, this is a classic problem in uh, any secure security system where you have to prove to someone who you are. Okay. Now, uh, if you may be a user logging onto system, in that case you have to authenticate yourself to the system saying that you are such and such user, but authentication is going to arise in many different contexts. Okay, so, clearly if somebody calls you on the phone and claims to be someone, you do not really know who that person is because there is no way to authenticate. So, when you are talking to a remote user, you need to actually authenticate their identities in order to do something with them. Okay, so, so we will look at a several, few different authentication protocols uh, and then we will get into encryption and we will get into some of these other basics of uh, security and then look at applications to distribute access. Okay, so, let us start with authentication. So, so it, we are going to use uh, two ent uh, you, uh, users Alice and Bob for all of our examples because that is how all security examples work. Okay, so, we will assume in this case. Uh, they could both be people, Alice and Bob could be computers, one of them could be a user, one could be a computing device, does not really matter. Okay, in this case, Alice is trying to authenticate herself to Bob and she simply says, I am Alice. Clearly, Bob has no way to know if that is uh, Alice or an intruder or, or uh, a mask, someone, someone who is masquerading as Alice because someone else could also claim to be Alice. So, you have to figure out or Bob in this case has to figure out if Alice is actually who she claims to be. Okay. Now, in the context of computing networks, at one point this authentication was also done with IP address. Okay. So, you could say I am machine x dot c s dot umas dot edu and then you could just check the IP address and validate whether the machine was actually that machine or someone else. 
Okay, but that's not really a secure way of doing it because it is very easy to spoof IP addresses in, uh, in TCP IP. You simply have to replace the source address in the IP packets with some other address and the other machine will not know where your packet actually came from. Okay, so not a secure way, you can't use IP addresses to authenticate machines with some machines did. So in most cases, you are going to use some sort of a secret to authenticate yourself. Simplest ones are passwords, of course. So you are going to say, I'm Alice, okay, that's your username, and here is my password. Okay, so you send your password, which is what some early protocols did, okay, and many protocols still do, but not this way. Okay. Now, if you just send these messages over a network, they go in plain text. Okay, so some intruder can actually look at the contents of the packet and then your password has been compromised. So you're not going to want to send usernames and passwords in plain text or clear text. Okay? So protocols like Telnet, FTP, that essentially do authentication or clear text are not really used anymore because they're not secure. They're vulnerable to uh, intruder, which in this case is Trudy is sitting between Alice and Bob and sniffing network packets and trying to look at contents of packets. Yeah. So we are going to use better techniques and one technique, or we are going to see two, they are all going to use encryption schemes okay, for authentication. Okay, so uh, I'm assuming all of you at least know at a very high level what encryption does. Okay, it's going to essentially scramble your data so no one else can figure out what it is. And your encryption algorithm is essentially going to use a key which is used to scramble and descramble messages. Okay, so any encryption algorithm uses a key. Think of it as a function that takes a string, uses a key and maps it to another string. And the function of that encrypted string is you will not know what the original string was unless you have the key. Okay, either you shouldn't be able to figure out what it is. So we'll use an encryption algorithm. So in this case, Alice is going to send a message to Bob encrypted with a shared key okay, that is only known to Alice and Bob. Okay, so this encrypted message is going to go, which says, I'm Alice. Bob will use that key to decrypt that message. Since the key is only known to Alice and Bob, okay, Bob will assume that the message actually originated from Alice. Okay, is that clear? Okay. So this is not, still not really secure because what can happen is a type of an attack which is called a man in the middle or a playback attack. Okay. What could potentially happen is this encrypted packet that's going over a network could be intercepted by Trudy. Okay. And at a later point, you do what's called a replay attack. You simply present this encrypted packet back to Bob and claiming to be Alice. Okay? Because the packet is already, or that message is already encrypted with the right key. If you simply take this message and present it at some later point in time, there's no way for Bob to know that this is not Alice or not. Okay? So this is, these are called replay attacks. So is this, although you are using encryption, this is still a vulnerable authentication protocol. Is that clear? Okay, so what should we do? Okay, you can keep a timestamp in the message. So somehow you have to know that this message has not been used before. Okay? So what we will do is we will not use timestamp, but we'll use a variant on a timestamp, which is essentially going to be called a nonce. Okay? So essentially you don't want, and the same problem is going to happen if you use the password as well in the encrypted message, because you can just replay the password, encrypted password. So, so what you want is every time you authenticate, you want a new way to authenticate that cannot be reused at a later time. So either you are going to use a sequence of password which changes on every login attempt, okay, or we are going to use essentially what is called a once in a lifetime only nonce. Nonce is essentially an integer that you are going to use once and never use again for authentication. Okay? So we will now have a different protocol which Alice is going to send a message to Bob saying, I am Alice. Okay, this goes unencrypted at the moment. Okay, Bob is going to send a message back to Alice saying, prove it. Here is a once in a lifetime nonce. You're going to send an integer back. So you got to prove that you're Alice, and here's an integer. Okay? This integer is chosen once, and assume that it will never be chosen again when Alice tries to authenticate herself. Okay? So what Alice is going to do is now encrypt that integer with the shared key. Okay? So your nonce, which is n, that's an integer, is encrypted with the nonce. Okay? with the share with the key and you send that to Bob. Bob will decrypt it and when you decrypt it, you get the nonce back. Okay? 
So now, because only Alice has the shared key, the key is only known to Alice and Bob, you know that only Alice could have encrypted this message. Okay? It's a once in a lifetime nonce. So it cannot, even if an intruder actually captures this packet, it's useless because the next time you try to authenticate, it will generate a new nonce. Okay? So you're not, never going to use it again. So this is not going to be vulnerable to playback attacks. Okay? So if you decrypt it and you see the nonce, you say Alice is authenticated, can log in, otherwise you say no. Okay? So this, this is an authentication protocol which is going to use encryption, but essentially it is used one, one time password. Your nonce is acting like a password. Okay? So it's actually a challenge, not really a password. But so you, but you use it once every time you authenticate, next time it won't get used again. Yes. Okay, that's a good question. The question is, why don't we authenticate, uh, not authenticate, encrypt the message saying, I am Alice. Okay, so you don't actually have to encrypt that message. Okay, so even if an intruder says, I am Alice, okay, and then Bob will send a nonce. Okay, intruder does not have the key to encrypt it and send it back. So that is not going to do anything. Okay, so, so you don't really need to encrypt. You could, but it's not necessary. It's a very lightweight protocol. It only uses encryption where you have to. Okay, any question, other questions here? Yes. Sorry, what's your question? Does B have to be stateful? So in this case, both Alice and Bob have a shared state, which is the shared encryption decryption key. Okay, so that's maintained somewhere on disk. Okay, you are trying to authenticate, so assume that you are trying to remote login or something like that. So once you authenticated, your session is active and Bob in this case will have to know that you authenticated. You could be logging into web application, logging into machine, it doesn't matter. Okay, in that sense, you have to keep some state saying now you authenticated for the duration of the session. Okay? Yes, question. Okay, so what, what's your question? You are, you are encrypting the nonce? You are encrypting the nonce, which is an integer. Right? You say, I am Alice, you get a challenge saying, here's an integer, prove that you are Alice. You take that integer, you encrypt it and say, here's the encrypted version of whatever you sent me. Okay, and then Bob decrypts it and verifies that whatever was sent is the message that came back in encrypted form. Is that clear what, what's happening? Yeah. Yes. So once the session has started, can you use the same attack? So you cannot replay this attack because the nonce is only valid for each login or authentication attempt. If you try to log in again, you will get a different nonce. Right? So nonces are not used in this way, but many other ways. If you use two-factor authentication, which we'll get to in a moment, Okay, it sends you an integer every time you try to log in, it keeps changing. That's an example of once in a lifetime type scenarios. But no, it doesn't use this technique, it uses a different technique. Okay, yes. Okay, question is, can you use signing scheme? You could, we'll come to that. But the issue is, you still need a once in a lifetime value somewhere in there, because you could still sign saying I am such and such, send a signed message, but if that message gets intercepted, somebody else could actually use that as well. Okay? We'll see two ways to use two keys to get around that as well. Okay? So we'll come to that actually. Okay? So the same thing can be done using uh, what is called public key cryptography. So encryption algorithm come in two forms, symmetric and asymmetric. Okay? In symmetric encryption, there is one key that is used for encryption and decryption. It's the same key. Okay? So if you essentially use the key and the encryption function, you get a, dec a string. Okay? If you use that string and the same key, you get back the original string. Okay? So, so the same key is used for encryption and decryption. The decryption function and the encryption function use exactly the same key. But in asymmetric key cryptography, also called public key cryptography, you are going to have two keys. Okay? One is called a public key, one is called a private key. So every uh, encryption is essentially going to, technique is going to use a pair of keys, not a single key. Okay? So the idea is as a user, if you want to use encryption, you are going to generate this key pair, a public and a private key. And the assumption is the public key can be given to anyone. You can make it public. 
the private key you key hold as your secret is assumed to be only known to you. Okay? That's the general idea behind public key cryptography. We'll see how to use it. Okay? So now we have a pair of keys, not a single key. Okay? So we'll take the same authentication technique and now see how we can use public key cryptography. Okay? So Alice is going to try to authenticate herself saying, I'm Alice. Okay, Bob is going to say, here is a once in a lifetime nonce, okay, integer, prove that you are Alice. So Alice is now going to take her private key, okay, which is essentially labeled as D of A. Okay, so that's her private key, only known to her. Okay, and she's going to encrypt the nonce okay, and send it back to Bob. Okay. And the assumption now is her public key is known to whoever need, okay, wants to use it for any reason. Okay, so Bob will know it as well. So Bob can actually take the public key, which is well known, Alice's public key, take the encrypted message, decrypt it, okay, and then get back the nonce and validate. Okay. Notice that so can anyone else, because the public key is known. Anyone else can decrypt that message, but that's no, no use because only being used for authentication, not for secret communication. Okay, you wouldn't use this for secret communication because anyone can decrypt your message. So it's completely pointless to use it for that. But authentication, it doesn't matter. Okay, because all you're trying to do is prove to Bob that you are Alice. If somebody else also figures out you are Alice, no, there's no problem with that. Yes, question. When can this fail? Okay. So this can actually, you had another question before I answer that. Mine's less analytical and more like what's going on. Okay, what is going on? <laughs> all right. So this is the same protocol as before. Okay, so if you know what we said previously, we are simply trying to authenticate. It's like you're trying to log into a machine. That's authentication. You, okay. I have a specific question. Right. That's, that's, you know, okay, so what's your specific question? Can A send multiple messages to B, saying like, I am this, I am that, like multiple messages, or is it only one message per once-in-a-lifetime value? Okay, so this is for one authentic login attempt. So think about I'm going to do use this to do SSH or SFTP, or I go to a website and try to push, enter your username. Okay, typically you know, there you enter username and password, but let's assume you use this protocol. So you enter a username, you are going to get a integer. Okay, you are going to encrypt the integer and enter it on the screen, and then you are going to get basically this protocol is going to tell you whether you are logged in or not. Okay, I see. Okay, that's okay. So your question is when will this fail? Okay, so this is essentially going. We'll come back to where the problems might occur. Okay, so. The main issue with public key cryptography is nothing to do with the encryption algorithm. It is how are you going to make your public key known to someone else? How do you make your public key public is where the problems will occur. Okay? So for example, many people will put their public key on their web page. Okay, you may have seen people have PGP keys sit on their web pages. Okay? That's their public key. Okay, now, Imagine that somebody actually hacks into the web page and replaces that public key with their public key. An intruder has actually replaced a valid public key with their public key. And now Trudy goes to Bob and says, I am Alice. Okay? Bob says, here is a nonce. In this case, Trudy is going to encrypt it with her private key, not Alice's private key, with her private key and send it back. Bob has to first get Alice's public key from somewhere. Suppose Bob says, I'm going to go to Alice's web page and get it from there. And the web page has been hacked and you put the wrong public key, you are going to now be in trouble because you use somebody else's public key to authenticate Alice. Okay? So this very simple example illustrates problems with many encryption protocols, which is what called key distribution. How are you going to get the keys known to all the parties that are involved? If you don't have a good way to distribute keys, you are not going to essentially get a good encryption algorithm. Okay, is that clear? Okay. So this is very similar to a physical scenario where maybe you put a big lock on your door, but if you don't guard your key, that lock is of no use. If you keep it under the mat and say, if you can basically, that's where I'm going to hide it, then what's the point of the lock? Right? So it's the same problem. You, if you don't actually distribute your keys well, you're not going to make use of your encryption algorithm. Okay. Is this clear? All right. So we're going to move on and talk about. So that's essentially this problem, which is called man in the middle attack. The same example I gave where Trudy is trying to masquerade as Alice okay, by essentially tricking Bob to use her public key to authenticate Alice. 
Okay, you give the wrong key to Bob and say that's Alice's key and then Bob doesn't know which public key he is using and then does the wrong thing. So that's the problem that you're going to have. So authentication is only as secure as public key distribution. That's true for many encryption algorithms. Okay, many encryption things we are going to see. And we'll see how to solve that problem as well. Okay, so this is just a simple example that I just gave you. So let's take authentication so, uh, and then an encryption that we learned and now see how can we use some more interesting things, do some interesting things with it. Okay. So you can use encryption to essentially do what are called uh, digital signatures. Okay. Just as you sign a piece of paper okay, and then your signature actually means something, you can sign an electronic document with an electronic signature okay. and then that has the same property as a normal signature. Okay. And the properties are the following. Okay. The first property is what is called repudiation, which is that the sender cannot claim that I never signed it. Okay. You can take the signature as proof that you signed it. Okay. Then I have a signed paper and this is your signature, so you must have signed it. So you cannot, once you sign it, claim you didn't sign it. That's one property of a signature. And the second property is the signature shouldn't some, be something someone can fake. Okay. Somebody else shouldn't be able to forge your signature. Okay, so if you have a technique that allows us these properties, you have the same properties as you have in the physical world. Right? When you actually take a piece of paper and sign it, sign a document or a contract. Okay? So how are we going to do this? We can essentially use public key cryptography to essentially do this. Your private key is something you can use to sign documents. Suppose that you want to sign a document. Okay? Document, think of a document as a large string. Because any document is just a file which is basically a string of bits. Okay, so you can take that string of bits and you can encrypt it with your private key. Okay, this encrypted form of that document or that string is actually also a signed version of that document. Okay, anyone can verify that you signed it. If they get your public key, they can de decrypt the document and say that you have encrypted it, so it must be your signature. Okay. You can't say you did not sign it because your private key is only known to you. Okay. So long as it didn't get hacked and all of those things. So you basically, you, can, uh, you cannot claim you did not sign that document. Okay. So that's essentially what is shown here, saying you have a message M or a document, you are going to use your, uh, uh, in this case, Bob is the one signing it. Bob uses his private key, essentially encrypts the document, that encrypted version of the document acts as a crude signature. We'll see better ways to do this, but this is our version one or attempt one at trying to sign a document. Okay? So we can just use public key cryptography to do this. Okay? It can be then verified and so on. Okay, is that clear? Okay, so now we'll see better ways to do this. Okay, the first thing is, Although you can use public keys and private keys to sign documents, you have to realize that it's going to be computationally expensive to do. Because public keys and private keys are supposed to be very secure, the key sizes are very long. Okay? The longer the key, the more computationally expensive your encryption and decryption algorithm. Okay? The complexity of your algorithm is always going to depend on A, the encryption algorithm and the decryption algorithm and the length of the key. The longer the key, the more computation it involves to encrypt and decrypt. Okay? So if you have 124-bit keys or, or 2048-bit uh, keys, which are really long, this is going to be expensive. It may be a 100-page document that you got to sign. Okay? It's going to take a long time to encrypt, long time to decrypt and so on. Can we make that process more efficient? We have the same properties, but make it more efficient. Okay? To do this, we are essentially going to uh, use a concept called message digest, which is essentially a hash function. Okay? So what we are going to do is pick a good hash function. We'll get to what is a good hash function in just a moment. Okay? So you have a hash function h that can take an arbitrary length string and hash it to a fixed length string. That's what hash functions do. Okay? Any hash function is going to take an input string and give you a fixed number of bits. That is the hash value of that string. Okay. So let's take the, our original document that we want to sign and hash it. Okay. So now you get a hash value. Okay. We are going to call that the message digest because that's the summary of the document. Okay. The hash acts as a very crude summary of what's in the document. Okay. And now we are going to actually have the user sign the hash, not the original document itself. Okay. So the signed value of the hash is now going to act as your signature. Okay. The document is not encrypted in this case. 
okay? only the hash is encrypted with your private key. Okay? So if somebody wants to verify if you signed it, they can take the document. The hash function is well known. Hash function is not a secret. You can just say, I use this hash function. Okay? I use MD5 or use SHA-11 of these hash functions. So you can actually take any document, any string and recompute the hash on that string. And then you can use the public key to decrypt this value and then compare the two hash values. If they match, that means you signed that document. If they don't, then you can say either the document was tampered or you did not sign that document. Okay? Yes, question. Okay. So, in this case, the document is encrypted as part of the signature. Okay. So, if you have a contract, you just give an encrypted version of a file. You, when you decrypt it, you get the original file that you signed and the, uh, the property that you signed it. So, uh, I guess my question was more like, how does Alice know what the file is? Is the whole point of this is to get the file across? Okay. The point is not to send encrypted document. We are talking about digital signatures, not encrypted transmissions. Okay? So, we are not talking about encrypted communication here. We are simply saying, can we use encryption to make, allow people to sign document digitally and have the same property as I actually signed something on a piece of paper. Right? So, that is what we are trying to do and there are now, you can sign PDFs this way. Okay? So, you do not actually have to sign a piece of paper. You can just do this kind of stuff with PDF documents and so on. Okay. So, now we said well, we need a good hash function so that this is uh, all good and then the hash function that we would want should have the following properties. The first is given a hash value, okay, given some hash, you should not be able to brute force construct a message that generates that hash. Okay. If you could do that, you can then take the hash and claim that you signed arbitrary document that you never signed because you are constructing some document that will generate that hash value. So, you should not be able to do that. Okay. The second thing is you should have minimized the probability of collisions. If there are two documents, the probability that they map into the same hash value should be as low as possible. Okay? Because then again, if you have collisions, you cannot prove which one you sign because you only have the encrypted hash value, not the document itself. Okay? So, if you have those two properties, then you have a good hash function. Okay? There are many such hash functions that you will find in the encryption literature. The old one used to be what was called message digest 5, MD5. Okay, it essentially used uh, 512 bit, uh, it took a message, it partitioned it into 512 bits, then it used a set of uh, uh, keys from uh, taken from a master key that it repeatedly encrypted, not encrypted, hashed I should say, repeatedly hashed to construct the hash value. Okay. I will not go into the details of MD5 or any other hash function. I just wanted you to show this picture saying the hashing itself it may be computationally expensive. Having said that, MD5 is not even secure because if the keys it uses for hashing are too small. Okay. So, this is not used anymore. What is actually used are um, hash functions which belong to uh, the secure hash algorithm or SHA where, where you have essentially a hash function use 256, 512 bits and so on and so forth. Yes, question. No, it has brute force attacks because you have only 5, uh, I think it uses some 64 bits or something. So, you could construct values that will generate the hash because it is cheap to do brute force. Okay, the long, the more computationally expensive thing are the brute force, I mean many of these uh, encryption algorithm, all of them are vulnerable to brute force attacks because I could generate a dictionary of every possible message and use the thing to say what is the encrypted message. So, I can take an encrypted message and try to figure out what the original message is. If it is cheap enough, I can just do brute force. So, you do not want to be able to launch brute force attack. So, you want to make these encryption hashing functions computationally expensive, so you cannot brute force. Them. So, that is the basic point. Okay, so, they essentially increase the number of bits, etcetera in the hash functions to make it more expensive to do and hence you cannot do brute force. So, these days you will use things like SHA-2 and what not and there are bigger hash functions as well. Okay? But they are all going to give us the property of if you have a hashed value, you can sign it and you have now a digital signature. Know that that is not how you are going to communicate. 
okay, you're not sending documents unencrypted with signatures. You are, if you're actually communicating with someone else, you want to encrypt everything. Okay, we'll look at SSL in just a moment where the entire communication is encrypted. This is just signature. This is not encryption for communication. It's encryption to sign something. Okay? Okay. So now let's talk a little bit about this whole notion of key distribution. How are you going to generate a key that you can securely share with another party? Okay, we'll look at several different ways to do this and we'll end with certificates. Okay, so the standard way is you, for every session, you want to generate a, like if it's an encryption session or login session, you want to generate a key. And that key is only known to the two parties that are involved in communication or authentication or whatever that you're trying to do. And then you use it for that purpose. Okay. So the question is, how do you generate this key? Typically, you're going to use a trusted third party, okay, which is called a key distribution center or a KDC. Okay. So Alice and Bob want to communicate. Okay. You go to a third party which you both trust and say, can you generate a key for us? Okay. That third party will generate a key for that specific session and then you use it for communication. And then the next time you do this, you generate a new key. So every session will have a key that you may generate. Okay. So in this case, what is assumed is uh, Alice and the key distribution center have generated a pre pre-generated a key that enables the two of them to communicate securely. Bob and KDC have generated a key that the two of them know how to communicate securely. Alice and Bob don't yet have a shared key that allows them to communicate, okay? Because they've never met, say, they're the two, two machines that are trying to talk for the first time. So there's no way for them to have exchanged a key. So, but they are both trust a KDC. So you can just ask the KDC to generate a key for you. So Alice will send a message to KDC saying, I'm Alice unencrypted message at this point saying, I want to communicate with Bob. Okay? So the KDC in this case is going to generate a key that is meant for Alice and Bob. And this key is going to be encrypted with the key that Alice and the KDC have pre-generated. So that's K A comma ADC. So that's the key that only known to Alice and the KDC. Okay? So that gives you a key. And the same key, which is K A B is sent to Bob using a different key that's only known to Bob and the KDC. Okay, so there are two keys that you know, how each party knows how to talk securely with the key distribution center. Okay? So the key, key distribution center is now securely generating a key and handing it to the two parties after which they can communicate. Okay? Question, yes. Okay, so can you actually attack the KDC if you take over the KDC or in trouble? That's why it's trusted. So you don't want to assume that would happen. But yes, I mean, the, if you can't trust the trusted source, then we are in trouble. That's why it's supposed to be trusted and secure. So that's what we'll assume, okay? But we'll see other ways to do better things than this. Okay, so now you can also do this. Uh, there are many variants of this. You can generate keys, you can have nonces and things of this sort. So here, th this is a variant on the first protocol where the keys actually, both encrypted keys are given to Alice and Alice is the one who initiates communication to Bob. Okay? It's the same message. So this mess the second message in the previous slide went directly to, to Bob. Okay? So in the, in the variant, you take both of these messages, which is the key encrypted for Alice and Bob, but you send it to Alice and then Alice sends the second key to Bob, as you'll see here. Okay, saying, I'm Alice, here's a key that the KDC has generated that allows us to communicate securely. And after this, all the communication is going to be secure. Okay. So there are many variants of this. You can use public key cryptography, which is shown here. Looks a little complicated, but not really that complicated. Here, what you're going to do is you're going to use nonces as well. Okay. So you will see that there is R, which is basically a one-time nonce. There's all this terminology you got to know. So you will essentially take, so Alice is going to send a message to the KDC saying, I'm Alice, I need to communicate to Bob, he has a one-time nonce. Okay. The KDC is going to send back a long message which says, this is your nonce. Okay. So this basically proves that this is a one-time thing. You, are, you said you want to communicate with Bob. Here's the share secret key that you are going to use to communicate with Bob. And this is the encrypted version of that secret key that you should send to Bob so Bob can get it secure. Okay? So this entire message is going to get encrypted with the key that is only known to Alice and the KDC. So you can extract all of those pieces and then you are going to send 
that key as well as a second nonce to Bob, which basically allows it to be a one time session thing. Okay, so, then Bob can extract the key first because you, you have a key that is only known to you and the KDC. You extract that key, you use that key to extract the nonce and then you send back the nonce saying I got your nonce, here is another nonce. Okay, so, you are going to use one time session nonces to make the protocol even more secure in addition to having one time session keys. Okay. This is called a needham schroeder protocol. It essentially combines one time session keys with the use of nonces to prevent all sorts of other problems that could arise in terms of attacks and so on. Yes, question. Yeah, so question is why are you uh, sending nonce minus 1? I do not think that achieves anything. You could have just sent the nonce, but that is what the protocol did. Okay, just to show that you computed something, but you did not really have to do that. Yes. Okay, question is what is this, does this give you as compared to the first one where you sent a message directly to Bob. So, the only advantage this gives you is Alice can initiate a communication to Bob, okay, so in terms of a socket connection. Otherwise, what happens in the first protocol is you suddenly get a message from the KDC saying someone named Alice wants to communicate with you. You at this point have no idea who Alice is, what the IP address is, nothing. Okay, in the next variant, Alice actually is assuming these are two computers. I set up a connection and says, I am Alice. I want to communicate with you. I already got a key from the KDC. That is the only difference. Okay. And then the same is true here. Okay. So, here Alice is the one that is going to initiate the communication. Yes. This, the, this, this one. Third segment, this one. Yes. This part. Okay. So why is there? So th this is essentially the key that Bob needs to know. Okay. The KDC has also said that it's actually going to be Alice who's going to use the key. So nobody else can send this masquerading as Alice and things of that sort. Okay. So there are some steps here which add a little more detail. Whether all of them are needed depends on the scenario, but this is the full blown version of it, which adds a lot to the previous one. I mean, the previous version have good properties. This is a simpler version, it does not use nonce, has some good properties. This is adding a whole bunch of additional things to it. Okay. But we want to analyze exactly why you need some of these here. Okay. Okay, so last thing is to get rid of our KDC altogether. I say, let us do this with public key and private keys. So, you are essentially going to say Alice knows Bob's public key, Bob knows Alice's public key that is assumed because public keys are well known and each has a secret private key of their own which is not known to anyone else. Okay, so, here is Alice is going to send a message to Bob okay, saying I am Alice, here is a nonce and you are going to essentially encrypt that message with Bob's public key. Okay, which Alice knows. So, Alice is going to take Bob's public key saying, I am Alice, here is a non send it off to Bob. Only Bob can de decrypt this message because only Bob has the, the private key. Okay. So, Bob will say, this, uh, Alice wants to communicate with me as a non. So, Bob will at this point generate that one time session key which is KAB. He is going to include the nonce that was sent and he is going to send a second nonce back. We okay, want to do a nonce authentication both ways. So, then and then that message is going to be encrypted with Alice's public key, which Bob knows. Okay. So, then this message can only be decrypted by Alice because it is encrypted with her public key. So, she can check, verify that the nonce has come back. So, that is basically a one time nonce. Then you have a reverse nonce, a challenge in the opposite direction and a session key. So, what you will do is you will take these three pieces, you will take that one time nonce that came from Bob and encrypt it with the session key that Bob generated and send it back. Okay. Now, since Bob knows the session key, Bob generated it. So, Bob can now extract the nonce and know that Alice has actually sent it back. At this point, you have a session with the, with that has used nonces and you generated a session key. Okay. No KDC involved in this case. Okay. Except that you may want to make sure the public keys are securely distributed. Otherwise, you are in trouble again. Okay, so, this is essentially key distribution. How are you going to generate key?
keys in a secure way to do this, but this also assumes that the public keys are securely distributed before you securely distribute a session keys. Okay, that part you got to keep in mind. Okay, so how do we generate public keys that are securely distributed? Okay, typically you are going to use something called certificates. Okay, so what happens is you basically go to a certification authority, which is called a CA, and say issue me a public key and a private key and then make and then validate that this is my identity. Okay. So what the certification authority in this case is going to do is a trusted server, okay, which is a certification authority, is going to essentially say this this public key belongs to Alice and I have certified it. Okay. So you don't actually put a long hex string on your web page saying this is my PGP key. Instead you use a certificate which is already encrypted form and it actually has your name in it and your public key in it and it's encrypted with the certification authority's private key. Okay, that's how they've signed it because you're signing that thing. This is a, that's why it's called a certificate. It certifies your identity. So certification authority has signed it with their private key. Now it is assumed that the certification authority or the trusted party has a public key that's actually known to everyone. Okay, that's the bootstrapping phase. You don't know anyone else's public key, but you do know the certification authority's public key. Because maybe that's built into your browser when it was sent to you. Okay? So then you're, you can essentially validate the certificate saying, I did this certification authority certify that this is Alice's public key. And then you believe that it's Alice's public key. So in this case, an intruder cannot actually inject a fake key and claim to be Alice. All that you can do is inject a fake key that is signed by a certification authority, but it will say that's Trudy's key, not Alice's key. Is this clear? Okay. So this is how browsers are going to work. If you actually have a secure session, if you click on that green lock that you will actually see on your browser, you will see the certificate popping up. And that's because that server has actually gotten a key that certifies that that is the server and that its key, is pub its public key is actually encrypted by a certification authority. Your browser actually trusts a set of certification authorities. Okay. So anything that is signed by those certification authority, a browser will believe is true. It will not believe that there's any problem with it. Okay. So in this case, you don't actually need a KDC distributing key. Okay. Your KDC is a certification authority that's signed this one time and it allows you to then distribute it. Okay, it cannot be changed or tampered with because it is signed and it's encrypted by a certification authority. Okay, so that's essentially how you are going to do all of this. Okay, the bootstrapping step, of course, is you need to know the certification authority's key. Okay, so that has to be known to everyone. Otherwise, this does not work because that's how you are going to validate did the certification authority who I trust does that uh, essentially certify that this key is actually belong to Alice or Bob or whoever it claims to be. Okay. Now that there are, of course, the question that was asked saying can the KDC be hacked and so on. Of course, certification authorities can be hacked and so on. That is why certificates can be revoked as well. Okay. So there's a revocation step where you can have certificates. So certificates always have time. They will expire after a time. They're not going to be valid for unlimited period of time. This is why sometimes if you go to a website, it will say certificate expired because they have to, they did not renew their certificate. You get it for a year at a time and things of that sort. So it has time and it can also be uh, revoked. So you can actually have a revocation list. So if you present a bad certificate because it got hacked, your browser will refuse to believe it or whatever software you use will refuse to believe that certificate is valid. Yes, question. Okay, so. Essentially, in this case, the um, um, E A and E S are the certification, uh, not certificate, public and private keys. Okay, so all this is doing is this is just saying that I went here and I got a certificate, okay? and I am now when I send a message to Bob, I can actually send my public key as part of that message instead of Bob going to, you have to ask, where did Bob get your public key? You can send it as a certificate saying, I am Alice, here is my certificate. And you can verify that it is signed by somebody you trust. So it is my key, my public key, not some other intruder's public key. So you, are, you will see that you are essentially doing all of that to figure things out. Okay? So, 
So, I won't go into the details of how you are going to use this to do encryption. We will just leave that aside for now, but you understand how you can do secure distribution of public keys. You should always get it certified and give it to someone. You should not put it on your web page as a uh, encrypt, unencrypted string and things of that sort. Okay. All right. So, we will now talk a little bit about how this applies in real distributed systems. Okay, so, if you take a typical computing environment, you will see that security of computing equipment, security of your systems and application does not just involve one small thing like encryption or authentication, it involves lots of different pieces. Okay, these are very complex environments as a result. So, you will have things like firewalls that are going to check all of the traffic. You will have additional devices which are called deep packet inspection devices that might look inside your network package to look for attacks, viruses, malware. You will have emails getting scanned by virus scanners. You might actually have things called VLANs, which allow you to isolate the traffic so it cannot be sniffed by unintended third parties. You will have radius servers. Those are the servers you use for providing your username, password. You might actually have Wi-Fi keys that will encrypt communication between your device and the access point and so on and so forth. There's VPNs, there's SSL, there's certificate. So, you will see that and that list keeps going. It does not stop on this page. You will see that there is websites that do this. There are two-factor authentication, one-time passwords and so on and so forth. Okay? So, you will see that security of systems has become very complicated. Okay? There is lots of different things that are in place to secure a network and an enterprise. Okay? And the reason for this is many systems are actually not designed with security in mind to begin with. You build the system, you put it out there, then you say, how do I protect it? Then you got to find all different ways it can be attacked and put a whole set of things to protect it. So, as a result, security is still not very clear how to secure enterprises because always ways by which intruders figure out how to enter an enterprise and hack machines and so on and so forth. Okay. So, the only purpose of this slide is to show you that distributed system security is not a simple task. Okay. There are lots of different things that are put in place in order to secure all the communication that happens, secure the data, secure the applications and so on. I am not going to go into all of these, but I am going to talk about a few of these things. Okay. So, so, let me say a few things about two-factor authentication. Okay. Maybe some of you use this already. Okay. So, if you have things like Gmail or any popular website, in addition to a username and password, it gives you a second level of protection by sending you a text message, okay, which is a one-time password every time you want to log in. So, you go to a website, you maybe Gmail, enter your username, enter your password, hit login, and then the server is going to push a text message often okay, to your phone. Okay. Then you have to enter that message as well, and that's a new, that's an integer. That's a once in a lifetime integer. So for that session, it's going to be valid. So next time you log in, it's going to push another message. Okay. This is called two-factor authentication, which uses two ways to authenticate: a password that only you should know, and it uses a secret code that is sent to a device that only you should have. Okay. So in, so if somebody is, if you use a easy to guess password you cannot still log into someone's account because they don't have your phone for example okay or if your phone is stolen hopefully your passwords have been chosen securely so there are multiple ways by which you can protect yourself so so that's called 2fa two factor authentication used and i think uh, even umass websites use it now uh, they use a two factor authentication there are many other things like this so there are challenge response system which might send you essentially when you try to log in, you could actually have a small key fob that has a already a pre-shared key and that is registered with the server. So, it shows you an integer. Okay. You got to enter that integer as valid for a certain amount of time and it lets you log in. Okay. So, that is called a challenge response system that is using a small key fob with a, which has a predefined encryption key that allows you to log into systems and so on. So, there are many different approaches that are being used and the short reason why this is being done is people are not good at choosing good passwords. Okay. You reuse your passwords across sites. Okay. You uh, pick passwords that are easy to guess that can be easily attacked with boot. And even if you pick good passwords, many times the, the system itself gets hacked and the password gets compromised. 
Okay, so if you have two or more ways by which you can protect your account, it makes it more secure or so is the, the thinking goes. Okay. So, so that's about how authentication actually done in modern websites. Here's a quick uh, slide that shows you how firewalls work. Okay. Because this is actually not using encryption. This is uh, using other methods to essentially protect all the traffic that is going in or out of your net. So what is a firewall? So firewall is essentially a small computer that is going to sit between the edge of your LAN and the outside internet. Okay, so firewalls can typically also be installed on routers. This is what typically happens. So if you have a home Wi-Fi network, that router essentially also typically would have a firewall built in. Okay, so what does it do? So essentially every packet that or every connection that's going out from your home, okay, so that's your internal network, out from your home to the outside and every packet that's coming in is actually going to be checked by the firewall. Okay? It will have a set of rules. The rules say what is allowed and what is disallowed and you can define whatever rules you think make sense for your network. So every packet that's going to go back and forth will be checked against those rules and if the rule say allows, the packet will allow, be allowed to proceed. If the rule says disallowed, the packet will be dropped. Okay? So you can set any rule you want. You can say, I don't want traffic coming from this IP address. So if uh, that machine tries to communicate, your uh, firewall will drop those packets. Or you can say, I don't want anyone to browse the web from this time to this time on my, in my organization. Okay? So then every outgoing HTTP connection is actually going to be blocked here okay, because you are not going to let port 80 traffic go out. Okay? Every packet is going to be checked against the rules because you can set rules on source address, destination address, source port number, destination port number. So typically you will have a tuple that tells you what is allowed and what is disallowed. The default rule is everything is allowed in both directions. Okay? And then typically if you have a NAT box, it's not going to let outgoing traffic in. Yes, question. Okay, so how does it deal with the IP spoofing problem? So firewalls will not necessarily deal with any IP spoofing problems. They are simply going to take a network packet that has arrived from either direction and look at its header. Look at the IP address it came from, the IP address it's going to, the port number it came from, the port number it's going to. So take those four values and look at a table saying, does there, is there a matching rule that tells me that this is allowed or disallowed? Okay. So if you have spoofed one of those fields, it could not just be an address, it could be also spoofing a port number, you may get a packet out. Okay, so it's not going to protect from that. But it is going to protect unauthorized traffic, that any traffic are disallowed from going out or coming in. Okay, any other questions here? Okay. So in addition to packet level filtering, Okay, many of these firewalls can also have things called application level gateways that do additional work. They don't look at just the headers, they can look inside the packet. Okay, that is why it's called application level gateway. So you could have an application gateway that checks for email traffic. Okay, so in addition to just the header, now if you look inside the packet, you might say this is a part of an email message. You could say I'm going to scan it for viruses because maybe it has a bad attachment or malware in the attachment. Okay, so you can do additional stuff that you can put onto the firewall or that can be done by other machines that allow you to do various interesting things with, and those are application specific. Those are not network specific. You have to do this for any application that you want to do something interesting with. Okay? So most common thing is to do virus scans or packets to make sure the packet doesn't have malware that's coming in and things of that sort. Okay, so we talked about firewalls. Okay, so we talked about access control. So I'm actually going to skip this and talk about secure email. Okay, so now I'll uh, basically we'll look at two applications in the remaining time we have. One is going to be securing email, and then we'll look at digital currency. Okay, how do you make uh, essentially electronic cash? Okay, we'll, and so we'll also talk a little bit about Bitcoin and things of that. So let's start with secure email. Okay. So you should know that when you send email, it's not secure at all. Okay. Everything is going unencrypted. Okay. The thing is actually being checked for who sent it. You can spoof somebody's sending address. You can do whatever you want. This is why you get a lot of spam. Okay. 
So and when somebody receives an email, there's really no assurance that it actually came from whoever it said it came from. Okay? By and large, you trust that when you get an email from somebody, it must have come from them, but it can be easily spoofed. Okay, so the question is, how are you going to make things secure? Uh, so, and we want, by secure in this case, we want four properties. Okay, we want secrecy. Okay? That secrecy essentially says, only the sender and the intended recipients should be able to read the contents of the message. Nobody else should be actually know what is in the message. Okay? That's secrecy. Okay? Then the second is sender authentication. It says, when I get an email message from someone, okay, I need to be able to validate that it actually came from them. It didn't come from somebody who's pretending to be them. That's, you are going to authenticate the sender. Okay, you want message integrity, which essentially says nobody tampered the message in transit. And you want receiver authentication, which also says only the receiver should be able to read the message. Nobody else should be able to read. Okay. So you want these four properties. So let's see how to do this. Okay. Secrecy we know how to do. You are going to use an encryption algorithm. Okay. So you could say I can just use public and private keys. If I want to send you a message, I am going to encrypt it with my private key and you know my public key so you can read the message. Okay. But we will say that is too expensive because public key and private keys are really long. They are very computationally expensive to use in encryption. So what we will actually do instead is use public and private keys, but also generate a key that is specific to this email message. Okay. So if Alice wants to send a secure email to Bob, Alice is going to generate a symmetric key, okay. Sym not a public private key, it's asymmetric, just a symmetric key K. She is going to encrypt the message with K. Okay. And then what she is going to do is send the encrypted message and she is going to take the key which is now encrypted with Bob's public key. Okay. So only Bob can extract this key because only Bob knows the private key. Okay, so this can only be decrypted by Bob. Once Bob gets the key from that message, Bob can then decrypt the message itself. Is this clear? So you are essentially going to generate an encryption key and encrypt the message, but you got to send that key to Bob. Bob does not know what key you used. So you are essentially going to take the key itself and encrypt it with Bob's public key, which you know. And so Bob, only Bob can extract that key and decrypt the message. Okay, so this is going to give us secrecy. Okay, this is better than just taking Bob's public key and encrypting the message. More efficient, not better, but more efficient. Because you could have just taken Bob's public key and encrypted him and sent it. And only Bob could have decrypted. But we are, we are saying that's more computationally expensive. So we are going to use a shorter key that will encrypt the message and then send the key itself as encrypted form. But it's only going to give us secrecy. It's not going to give us some of these other properties. Okay, so second property we are going to get is authentication and integrity, which means that we have to sign the message as well. Bob has no way to know Alice sent that message. It, you just get a message that's encrypted. There's no way to validate who sent it. Okay? So we are going to now sign this message. Okay? So we, are, we know how to do that as well. Okay? We are going to take the message and take a hash function H. And we are going to create a digitally signed version of that. So essentially, you take the hash of the mesh H of M, and then Alice is going to sign it with her private key, encrypt it with her private key. So that's a signature that says that I actually generated this message because I signed the hash of that message. Okay? So now you can send the message M and the signature to Bob. This is our digital signature process. Okay? Note that in this case, the M is not yet encrypted. There's no secrecy here. You're just basically getting authentication and integrity. Okay, you can check that the message was not altered in transit. If somebody injected some fake words, you would actually not get M, you will get M prime. That will generate a different hash, so you know that that's not what Alice signed, so this message has been tampered. Okay, so you know that. Okay, you also know that Alice sent it because Alice has signed it. Okay, so you are going to get authentication and integrity. Okay, but it does not give us encryption. Okay, to do both, all of these, you have to take the previous step this step and put it all together. That's what is giving us this. So you are going to take your message, you are first going to generate a hash, Alice is going to sign the hash. Okay. Then you are going to take the message and the hash, you get a new message M prime, which is what we are going to now encrypt. Okay. You are going to use, so you generate a key, K, and then you are going to essentially encrypt M prime with that key. Okay. So now you have an encrypted version of the message. 
and you have a key that you have to send. So, you are essentially going to send the encrypted version of the message and the key is also sent encrypted with Bob's public key. Okay? So, now Bob can essentially extract this key first because he has the private key. Once you get the key, you can essentially decrypt M prime. Okay? So, M prime is the original message and the signature. Then you can validate the signature and send Alice send this. Okay? So, you have secrecy, you have authentication, you have integrity. Okay? And you should know that only Bob can do this because the key is encrypted with Bob's public key. No one else can actually decrypt the message. So, if Bob only Bob receives the message that gives an automatic authentication for Bob. Okay? So, that is essentially how secure email actually works. You can generate a key and start encrypting your, you can just sign a message first of all. Okay, so, that most mail clients actually allow you to send a signed version of the message, so that the other client can verify that your message was not altered. So, in this case your message is going unencrypted, but the recipient knows that you signed it. So, that is actually validating that you sent it. Okay? And then you can also do encryption, which requires both parties to actually use public key crypto. Signatures you do not need to worry about, because it is signed with your certificate that can be obtained and then you can essentially decrypt it and check. Okay? So, so, you can just do this, which most client, mail clients do very easily, but you can also do this. Okay? This requires both parties to agree that they are going to use secure email and install the right keys and things of that sort. Any questions on this? Okay. So, we have a little bit of time. So, we are going to quickly talk about SSL, then I am going to spend the remaining 10 minutes or so talking about digital currency. Okay. So, as what is SSL? So, you probably, it is a very old protocol now. Essentially, it takes any socket communication that you have, which is essentially TCP communication and encrypts it, so that all the packets that are going back and forth are encrypted. Okay. So, in this case, the application does not have to do anything other than to say, let me open a secure socket connection rather than a regular socket connection. A regular socket connection is not encrypted. Okay. So, you are not going to do any encryption at the application level. You are simply going to hand, hand, uh, hand all of your packets to the SSL library. It is going to encrypt it, send it at the other end and then the other end will decrypt it and hand it to the application. So, applications have essentially offloaded the encryption to the network layer, in this case the socket layer, not really the network layer, but the socket layer. So, that is going to do all of that for us. So, so how is that going to work? So, let me give you an example. It is used in many contexts including when you do HTTPS, that is essentially doing HTTP over SSL or the secure sockets layer. So, here is the message exchange between your browser and the server in order to set up a secure connection. So, first your browser is going to send some preferences saying, I support SSL version 2 or whatever it is built with to the server. Okay. And the server is essentially going to say, yes, I support that same version, but very importantly is going to send you its certificate. It is going to present a certificate, which is basically its public key, the server's public key. Okay. So, a browser and that certificate has been signed by the certification authority. So, it is an encrypted public key. Okay. Your browser knows about that certification authority. It has a certification authority's public key, so it can extract the server's public key from the certificate. Okay, so, you decrypt the certificate, extract the, uh, the public key and you validate that that is the server it is saying, because it will have a name saying it is this google.com or cnn.com in the certificate with the public key. Okay. So, now you have the server's public key. So, you have essentially the first step is you obtained the server publicly and validated it. So, at this point, the browser is going to generate a session key k, which is going to be used to encrypt that SSL session, is going to encrypt k with the server's public key that came back. Okay. So, you generate a session key, you encrypt it with the public, uh, public key that came with the certificate and you send it off to the server. And essentially, you are going to say all messages will be encrypted. Here is the, uh, the, uh, the uh, key and now uh, the server is also going to come back to you and say yes, all messages will be encrypted. At that point, you essentially have shared a key and then your SSL layer will use that key to encrypt all messages that go back and forth. Okay, these are symmetric keys. Okay. You use public and private keys to bootstrap a session that will then use symmetric keys, a single key to encrypt and decrypt. So, only known to the server and your browser. 
okay every time you set up an http connection in this case a browser is actually going to do all of this in addition to setting up http connections okay any questions on this okay so that is ssl okay so i am going to skip kerberos in the interest of time and talk about electronic payments and currencies and so on and so forth. okay so the last 10 minutes or so we have let's talk about digital currency okay. so let's see how payments work in the physical world then we'll see how can you generate digital coins and things of that sort okay so here is essentially how you will use cash okay, you go to your bank okay you're essentially going to withdraw some cash you go to a merchant you can pay with cash and then the merchant will deposit that cash into their bank or use it for some other transaction okay the good thing about cash is it is all anonymous you can walk into a store and make a payment they don't actually know who you are okay that's a good property we'll come back to it okay now here's how check payments work kind of somewhat similar your bank is going to give you a checkbook okay so you basically sign a check give it to a merchant the merchant is going to present that check to their bank okay then your bank and the merchant bank is going to run a settlement process okay the your, the merchant's bank will present the check to your bank your bank will validate your signature and then essentially transfer that money from your account to the merchant's account okay so this is basically how check payments work credit card payments are somewhat similar okay your bank or a credit card company issues you a credit card okay so you basically present that credit card to a merchant okay the merchant is essentially going to validate your card and basically validate the amount and they can do that with essentially their bank okay which has given them a let's say a credit card terminal so they are going to transmit your credit card number and say i want to charge x dollars to it okay and then the bank might actually do some extra checks which are not shown here to make sure you have the right credit limit and so on but once that is validated there is going to be again a settlement process where that bank is going to come to your your credit card company or your bank and say this is the amount that was actually requested and then uh, that money gets transferred you get a bill you pay the bill and then everything is done okay so in both of these steps is less anonymity than cash because you basically present a check it has some in identifying information present a credit card it has your name and things of that sort okay yet little more uh, convenient than using cash because you don't have to take a lot of cash with you because cash can be stolen because anonymous is hard to track okay so this is basically how things work payments work in the physical world now let's see how to make some of this electronic and digital and what not okay so we'll look at two or three different approaches so this one is not really used but it was developed as a early digital currency protocol it not doesn't do anything like what bitcoin and those things do but predates them did not actually take off but try to emulate what uh, uh, cash physical cash does okay so essentially what you do is you are basically going to generate a digital coin which is like actual money you can say i generate a 1 dollar coin and then you go to your bank and have them sign it so that is valid okay you, so basically you go to the bank and say please certify that this is actually a 1 dollar coin that you have issued to me so the bank is going to certify that this is 1 dollar coin okay and then maybe it will deduct that from your bank account or whatever okay so and then also it's going to blind it Okay, so what the blinding process does is the coin actually has a unique uh, serial number okay, that you are signing, but that essentially allows it to be tracked. Okay, so you are essentially going to do a blinded signing, which is the equivalent of saying, "I put that uh, currency in an envelope and I signed the envelope." So I am not signing the the coin itself, but I am signing something that holds the coin, so that basically I don't know what. the sequence number is but i certify that is 1 dollar whatever that sequence number so i signed a, a blinded version of the coin okay so you give it to the, uh, the payer and then the payer can essentially go and present that to a merchant saying here is 1 dollar electronic okay now that payer uh, the the merchant can essentially go to the bank and say did you sign this that's basically you are going to use public keys and so on to make sure that it was signed or you could send a message depends on what protocol you use the bank certifies as valid 1 dollar okay and then the merchant accepts it okay because the bank did not know what the currency number was the digital currency number it cannot actually be tracked back to you so it's trying to emulate 
the same thing as uh, what physical cash does, where you know that it's a valid $10 bill, but you don't know, the merchant doesn't actually know who you are because you presented it to them. Neither does your bank because the bank has not actually associated the serial number to you and they gave you that cash. Okay? So that's what this process tries to do. Okay, there are of course protocols of how to sign it and so on that I'm going to ignore. The, the higher level idea was you're essentially using encryption to certify that this is valid money. You can present it, so you can't double spend it because this is an electronic piece of a message, a file. You could go to two merchants and try to spend it, right? Because it's just a piece, just something that a message that the bank has signed. But because the receiver is authenticating with your bank, the bank can actually validate that I did not, uh, once you basically validate it, once you can record that it's been spent. So if you will try to spend it again, the bank says this, this digital coin, I don't know who it is, but it's already been spent. I got, I already certified that it has been spent. Okay, so first time you do this, okay, you're essentially going to present that token or the coin to the bank. The bank will record that it has been spent. So if you try to spend it again, a bank has a record. Even though they don't know who you are, they know which money got spent. Is that clear? Okay, it's like prepaid cards that you do the same thing. You load some money, but every time you spend it, someone is tracking what the balance is. Okay, then once the balance is zero, you can't spend it anymore. The same kind of process, but using digital coins. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about modern digital currency, which is uh, you know, Bitcoin and all sorts of cryptocurrency. So the uh, I'll talk about Bitcoin, but the, the, high, uh, the high level thing that you should take away is a lot of the concepts that we learned in this class, digital transactions, consensus protocols, BFT, all of them actually are used in, the, in cryptocurrency because they, you basically have two parties that are not known to one another. There's no central authority in this case. Okay? There's no bank that is sitting and validating everything that everyone trusts. So you basically got to generate that trust from distributed set of nodes, none of whom might necessarily trust one another. Okay? So you need to have a lot of the techniques we learned about in terms of uh, fault tolerance and consensus and, and of course we'll do encryption and all of that. They all come together nicely in many of these cryptocurrency products. There are several of these okay, that uh, you probably have heard of. Bitcoin is the most popular. Okay? And then uh, as far as Bitcoin goes, the, the central concept that is driving it is there is essentially a peer-to-peer -peer distributed database called a distributed ledger. Okay? These are all ledger-based protocol. A ledger is simply think of it as a book where you're recording transactions. Internally, it's a distributed database. Okay? So every transaction that you make with this digital currency is tracked. So you know who owns. So every think of it as every Bitcoin has a number. And there is a database that says who owns it currently. And when you actually spend it and you transfer it to someone, the, uh, the ownership has actually been transferred and that is uh, recorded in a public distributed ledger. So you can always go back to that ledger and figure out who owns what, who spent what, and so on and so forth. Okay? So, uh, so essentially you have this notion of a distributed ledger and then you have a way to record transactions which I'll show in just a second. So now as far as Bitcoin itself is concerned, there are a few interesting things that they did. One is, uh, how is this currency generated to begin with? Okay, so, so they have this notion of a mining process where if you actually participate in the system and help with maintaining the ledger and validate transaction, after you do a certain amount of work, you may get a reward. That reward is essentially a new coin. Okay? So the currency is generated by participating in the system. You can't go to someone and say, let's generate 10 more coins for Bitcoin and then start spending it. It is generated internally by the system. Okay, furthermore, the protocol actually uh, dictates at what rate you're going to be able to generate new coins. Okay? And the rate at which you generate coins is dropping over time. That means that the amount of currency you will have in the Bitcoin system will exponentially decrease, the, the rate at which you generate it will exponentially decrease and you will essentially have an asymptotic limit on where it is. So, so the value of all the coins will have to rise if it, uh, typically you're going to have a limited amount of currency. Okay? So that's an aside, that's more economics than any distributed system. But, uh, but the high level thing you want to keep in mind is you got to do work to generate coins. 
So by participating in the system, you get a reward, and then that reward is you get a coin which you can then use to spend and buy things and what. Okay. The original rate at which you are going to do this was 25 coins were generated for essentially every 10 minutes based on the work that people did and so on. Okay. Now, to the, the work involves essentially what the it's called Bitcoin mining if you heard of this term. So essentially, you got to do computations and participate in the system to generate money. And the more computations you do, the faster you can generate money. Okay, so there are entire industry has been created around this where all you do is buy high-end machines with lots of GPUs and then you generate, uh, do enough work to generate money. Okay, and it's so far been profitable because the cost of the machines and the cost of the electricity to run those machines is still less than the amount of Bitcoin currency you're generating. Because it's like a main prim, you're printing or generating new Bitcoin. Eventually, if the value of it falls, then you are not going to be profitable. But until it's profitable, people are actually uh, using lots of computational resources to generate new coins and so on. Okay? So that's essentially a very high level overview of Bitcoin. But let's take a look at, uh, no, not this slide, that's the wrong slide. Uh, let's take a look at what distributed ledgers do. Okay? Distributed ledgers are useful well beyond cryptocurrency. They have actually seen a lot of use in many other scenarios as well. Okay? Any two parties that want to enter into a transaction, want to trade something and want to record their trade in some public ledger can essentially use a distributed ledger. And there are many variants of this as well. Okay, there's blockchains and there's hyperledger and Ethereum. You'll see that if you go into the literature, you'll see lots of these kinds of distributed ledgers that are being used for many different scenarios. Okay. So essentially the idea is, is decentralized, it's peer-to-peer. -peer. You don't need a central authority to do trading. Right. So think about stock trading. Okay. If I want to essentially buy or sell stock, I need a trusted entity, a third party, which is in this case the stock exchange that's acting as the intermediary. Okay, so you can essentially, it's enabling the transaction. Okay, so what if you did not have any such central authority? I want to essentially transact with a stranger. Okay, the stranger doesn't know me. I don't know the stranger, but we want to essentially record a transaction. So you want to essentially use a distributed ledger which you trust, okay, which will record that transaction for you without going to any central authority. So it's being used in many different scenarios. So it's used in healthcare where you are recording your health records in a distributed ledger. This way you don't have one doctor that controls all of your information. You control it and you can decide which doctor you want to share it with. There's energy trading that is being used using blockchains and distributed ledgers. You generate some solar electricity using some solar arrays. You can sell it to whoever you want and record that transaction. Okay. You don't need a utility to help you do that. So there are many scenarios where blockchains and distributed ledgers, which is blockchain is a type of a distributed ledger, are actually being used. Okay. So essentially, I won't go into the details of blockchain. So it uses peer-to-peer uh, peer systems. It uses a distributed consensus to decide when to commit a transaction. Yeah, because you want to write, a, write to the ledger and have it be recorded. So your set of nodes that are essentially going to run a distributed consensus protocol, and if they all agree that your transaction is valid, it will get committed and then it's recorded. So then you can prove that that transaction actually happened because anyone can go to the ledger and validate that that transaction took place. Okay. So I have one slide and then I'm going to stop, which is just a picture I actually took. So you will see uh, that if you want to essentially enter into a transaction, you are going to essentially encrypt that transaction and then present it to the ledger. Then the ledger is maintained by a set of peer-to-peer -peer nodes. These in the Bitcoin world are the miners that are essentially doing the computation to record the transaction. So they will essentially do some work, they will run some consensus protocol and then they will all agree that this is valid transaction, let's record it, it gets recorded and then you can actually do whatever physical activity you wanted to do as a result of this transaction. Okay. It's a pictorial view. Okay. There's a lot of math and consensus and encryption that goes behind it, but we are going to not go into that here because we are out of time. Okay. So with that, I'm going to essentially end it here. So we are done with the class. We have exam on Friday and I wish you all luck for the exam and uh, have a good summer, whatever your plans are. Okay. So that's, thank you.